Uh, my name is Susan Stone, and I'm president of Frontier Nursing University, and I'm going to call this session to order this morning. So I invite you to come on in and get a seat and get comfortable. Um, while you're doing that, I want to remind you that this is the first day of Nurse Midwif of, excuse me, Midwifery Week. And so we'll be celebrating midwives across the entire country uh, this week. And at Frontier, we're doing it a little different this year. We're holding what we're calling a digital summit. And we're going to kick that off by live streaming two sessions from the AABC conference, this one this morning and the one uh, next to, uh, uh, directly after this on collaborative care. So that means that anybody across the country can watch these sessions this morning and join in. And then we're going to also be doing, I don't know, I think are there about eight more sessions over the course of this week? So in, that you can sign into our website and uh, the topic is collaborative care and how it will improve outcomes. So that said, I'm going to get right into the first session this morning. And that session is called Building Bridges from Birth Center to Hospital Transfer and Collaboration. And we have with us this morning Dr. Larry Lehman, uh, who is an MD and MPH and Professor of Family and Community Medicine and Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He's the director of the UNM Family Medicine Maternal Ch Child Health Clinical Service, co-medical director of the University Hospital Mother Baby Unit and Level 2 Nursery, and medical director for the Milagro Perinatal Substance Abuse Program. He's the medical consultant for the Dar Luz, I hope I said that right, birth center in Albuquerque. As a faculty member at UNM, he has worked for 15 years as a consultant for home birth and birth center midwives and helped care for their clients who have required hospital transport. He was the physician member of the New Mexico State Licensed Midwifery Advisory Board from 1993 to 1998, and he has presented grand rounds for the UNM, OBGYN, and family medicine departments on home birth with a focus on facility, facilitating improved collaboration from home to hospital. Next, we have Maureen Darcy, who is a CNM. She is a birth center pioneer and seasoned midwife. For 35 years, she has advocated <laughs> at the local, state, and national levels for midwifery and the birth center model of care. She began her midwifery career at the Ch Chatham Family Birth Center in Silver City, North Carolina in 1981. And in 1995, she founded the w Women's Birth and Wellness Center in Chapel Hill, where she prioritized making the birth center option available to the poor and other underserved populations, and still does that every day. Uh, <laughs> Next, we have Heike Hornsby, who is an LMC CPM. She is a licensed midwife and the present co-owner of Puget Sound Birth Center in Kirkland, Washington. She is also the owner of Eastside Midwives and Birth Center Services. She graduated from the Seattle Midwifery School and has been practicing midwifery in homes or birth centers for nearly 30 years. So join me in welcoming these panelists. Good morning, everybody. It's a total delight to be here. You know, I came in a little bit late, so I arrived right in the middle of your benefit, and it was very touching. I've like, never seen such an enthused uh, bunch of folks at a benefit, and um, I'm going to try to see if we can uh, take the same model and see if people will like pay a thousand dollars to wear our hats for a year. And I'm just really, um, I was just really touched by the whole thing. <laughs> So um, I just, I'm going to give a little bit of brief background about myself, like how did I actually wind up you know, um, doing this, because people ask that question a fair amount. So um, I was really fortunate, I had early exposure to midwives. Uh, um, I had a Mae Gaskin at the farm, or when I was a medical student, I spent time with Elizabeth Gilmore, which I imagine a lot of you know from the Taos uh, Birth Center. Um, when I was a, a resident, um, it was <laughs> back in the sort of the dark days, and nobody would actually talk to the out-of-hospital midwives, and so I wound up doing that as a, uh, as a resident and got sort of trained, you know, really by the midwives as I was being trained as a, um, as a physician. Um, I actually went to, the out of, um, went to the home births for a while, and I was actually prohibited by the faculty from going to the home births, and I said, well, but you'll let people do home visits on babies, and... Uh, they said, yeah. I said, OK, well, I'm just going to come a little early sometimes. And <laughs> that was how I got some training there. Um, then I was able to, um, I went out to Zuni Hospital. And um, I was uh, 
uh, became the, uh, the director of that hospital. It really was a, you know, what the IHS calls a birth center model. It's not what you guys would call a birth center, but it's what IHS would call a birth center model. And so I really had, it was a very fortunate thing to be a physician working in a place that doesn't have an operating room. It gives you a whole different perspective. And so I did that for like seven years and we had to transport 40 miles away. Um, then I wound up getting more fellowship training um, in obstetrics, C-sections, the higher reach, uh, risk birth and stuff. And um, right now I work as the medical director at uh, the MCH service and the mother baby unit. So that's kind of my background. That's how I wound up getting here. And um, uh, during the talk, I'll explain how, how I wound up working with Dara Luce and I'll introduce Abigail. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, Zuni. I always like to put a picture in Zuni because honestly, what I've learned more—I learned more about birth being in Zuni anywhere else because I got to be at a place where it didn't have an OR. And when when there's a problem, rather than oxytocin, we called up the uh, Zuni aunties and they made sure the births got happened. And we had a 95% vaginal delivery rate from doing that. So I learned a lot by being there. So um, one thing um, with my bio that I. Uh, didn't mention, which I think is one reason I'm here, is I've been attending the home birth summits here as a representative for AFP, and I know there's numerous of you here that are at those same um, summits. And so I'm going to give um, my talk's going to be a little bit of a mixture. I'm going to give sort of the information that we about transfer and what we did from our transfer guideline task force from there. I'm going to talk some about our experience in New Mexico, and then some of the experience of working with Darlus. So this, um, back in 2011, this was called together, you know, Sarah's called this together, had national leaders from all perspectives. And, you know, really the idea of the home birth summits where we weren't just bringing um, providers, it wasn't solely midwives or physicians. We had people from insurance companies, we had doulas, we had consumer advocates, um, really to sort of look at, um, uh, look at the issue of home birth. And um, one thing you'll notice is through this, and I think we we're, even as we made this, you know, we sort of went back and forth between home and home and birth center. So a lot of this really does apply to birth centers, which is. So who attended here? There's kind of a mixture here. Uh, midwives, health policy folks, everybody who was sort of at the table at this meeting. And I think that was really helpful. We had everybody really in the room. So there wasn't like someone who wasn't in the room or some perspective that wasn't shared. Uh, just to give you an idea of what it looked like, that's, those are all the folks that, are, that were there, and I see some of these people here, actually. So cross-section, um, everybody had a, a passion for quality uh, maternity care and a commitment to improving safety. Everybody in the room didn't think out of hospital birth, home or birth center was necessarily a good thing. I mean, we had uh, uh, folks, I was the AFP rep, we had uh, folks from ACOG and different groups. And um, so there, that wasn't something that you had to be agree on to go in the room. What you had to be there to be in the room is that your goal was to make um, every, the process safer. <laughs> so all, all perspective, oh, can you hear me a little better there? All right, so all perspectives and viewpoints were considered, and the idea is to, to improve integration across birth sites for all women and family in the, in the U.S. I think you guys can all see Ginger here. Um, so the elephant in the room there. There's always an elephant in the room. It's better if you actually put it out in a picture there. So we didn't debate home birth is right or wrong. We didn't debate home birth as safe to harm and you know, agree or disagree. That wasn't the idea. We all agree that we wanted to improve care. And I think that's a good background here, but I think it's also really good, and we'll talk about that some, what do you do when you have challenging situations. I think that's a really good way to, to work things out with them um, if you have issues with hospitals or different groups that we're all focused on patient safety here. We're not focused on a debate about whether this is gonna happen or not. I think honestly, we're hopefully past that point in time. So summit outcomes, we had nine common ground statements and we had uh, different task force groups. And I was lucky enough to um, wind up working on the one that worked on issues of collaboration and transfer. So let me show you the statement that we came up with. Um, and it's probably worth reading it. So we believe that collaboration within an integrated maternity care system is essential for optimal mother baby outcomes. All women and families planning a home or birth center birth have a right to respectful, safe, and seamless consultation, referral, transport, and transfer of care. When ongoing interprofessional dialogue and cooperation occur, everyone benefits. And so, I mean, this you know makes it seem like common common sense. <laughs> But I think it was a step forward to have everybody, you know, we really had people representing all the maternity groups looking at that. 
So that was the goal, but what was the reality? Um, you know, the reality is that there's research that's been done, I think Missy Cheney's done some of it and is here, that looks at physicians and midwives reporting feelings of discomfort and friction um, uh, with consultation. So we know that there are a lot of problems that are existing. And we also know that coordination of care improves health outcomes. So that was sort of the background there. So the best practice guidelines is what we came up with. And so that, we didn't come up with these at the home birth summit. There's been three home birth summits. We had a working group. The working group um, consisted of um, midwives, physicians, consumer advocates, uh, um, and all. We kind of worked over really a period of years to kind of work on the, uh, the transfer guidelines. When you see that they're only four pages long, you wonder why it took us years. But it took us a long time to get that and get everyone to sort of agree. I'm joking. Um, so the idea is to promote the higher quality of care for women and families across all birth settings uh, and to come up with model practices for the midwives, model practices for the hospital-based uh, care provider and staff, and a quality improvement and policy development um, perspective there. Um, what we developed is the best practice guidelines. I believe everybody has access to those. I was told through the website of materials here. You can get them on the Home Birth Summit website, but I believe it's on the conference uh, uh, website as well. And this was felt to be appropriate for birth plan for home or for, or for birth center. And these are kind of open source documents that were available to everybody. So going back here, you know, from, um, uh, from the uh, Lancet here article, one thing is to ensure that midwives have effective backup when needed and part of a collaborative team of healthcare professionals. Um, you know, one thing that happened is, you know, as I mentioned, we were not discussing issues of sort of safety and stuff um, so much during the conference, but I think everybody is aware that there's lots of good articles that are out there showing safety of integrated systems. One thing that was really everybody was aware of in that room is that we don't have an integrated system, and so the goal of this is to um, promote that so we can have as good outcomes as happening in other places. So we came up with there's model practices for the, uh, for the midwife here. And I'll kind of go over some of these. I'm not going to read them all because um, I'll take all of our time here. But you know, some of it is, is that in the prenatal uh, period, the midwife provides information about hospital care and procedures that may be necessary and documents that are developed for hospital transfer. So kind of preparation for the situation when transfer occurs. And we'll talk about how um, uh, Darlus has done that in Albuquerque and all, but I think that there's a lot of good models for that. Um, you know, the midwife, of course, assesses status throughout the uh, uh, prenatal care and labor. Midwife notifies the receiving provider or hospital of the incoming transfer, reason for transfer and such. Um, midwife continues to provide routine care en route. And we had a lot of conversations about that. And even since the summits, we've actually involved some folks from emergency medical services and really trying to work on that aspect of it. Because I think there's a huge amount of variation. There's a huge amount of variation, honestly, in, in how much EMS is comfortable with, uh, with laboring women. Um, other model practices on arrival of the hospital, the midwife provides a verbal record, including details on the health status. Now, you know, this was for both birth center and home, and we know that there's actually uh, places where the midwives aren't legal, and so obviously that's an issue for that, but this is the optimal practices. Midwife may continue in a primary role as appropriate to scope of practice and privileges at the hospital. Midwife promotes good communication, ensuring the woman understands plan of care and the hospital provider understands the woman's need. If the woman chooses, the midwife may re remain to provide continuity and support. And so, I mean, we know that there's, there's hospitals where midwives are feeling like they have to drop a woman off at the door, or they can't really be involved, or she goes back. And so we really try to come out strongly that that's not um, a good practice. So how about for the hospital provider and staff? The hospital um, provider and staff need to be sensitive to the needs of the woman that results from the change in the, in the birth setting. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about Darlus later, but I think that is really a key issue for hospital providers. Um, they need to communicate directly with the, um, <coughs> with the midwife. The midwife can't be triangulated out of the process here, and the midwife needs to be part of the communication. Um, there needs to be timely access to maternity and newborn providers by direct admission to the labor and delivery or pediatric um, unit. And so the idea is that there's an easy process. You're not dealing with uh, emergency rooms and, uh, and such. And whenever possible, the women and a newborn are kept together. 
hospital providers and uh, staff participate in the shared decision making uh, you know process. So the the shared decision making that most midwives are doing with their with their clients should be extended to this environment. If the woman chooses hospital personnel will accommodate the pre presence of the midwife and primary support person. So you know that idea of having to choose. Uh, okay, you can have your partner, or your midwife. That that shouldn't happen. That you should have every uh, both people there. Hospital provider and the midwife coordinate follow-up care, and care may revert to the midwife upon discharge. Is sort of the model, uh, you know, model guideline. And relevant medical records, such as a discharge summary, are sent to the referring uh, midwife. So that, that's kind of the summary. And I mean, look at that. I think most of it looks like honestly like common sense, but by putting it down into sort of guidelines and having it there um, and having it endorsed by organizations, the idea is trying to be clear that this is acceptable and um, and that other practices may not be acceptable. The next part is quality improvement and policy um, you know, uh, development, which is the idea of having everybody participating in policy development um, and uh, incorporating model practices. You know, one thing that's difficult, and I think we're still working on it at a lot of sites, is how to do like QA processes. We're still working on that in New Mexico. How do you have quality assurance between birth centers and between uh, between hospitals? And part of it, it tends to vary depending on certain legalities in different sites. So what is the impact there? You know, um, when this works, it works you know really well. I mean, people, uh, women often have been uh, described as being surprised on how um, uh, that that they're being treated well. And uh, you know, I kind of read these sort of quotes, and I, you know, I think it's good, but it also makes it a little sad. You know, that uh, I'm surprised they read my birth plan and did everything to honor our intentions for the birth. Like that's that's still a surprise sometimes. Um, the point of view of the nurses in, uh, in impact and family. And it talks about when we receive um, home birth transfer, no one seems to know what to do or support the family or recognize the difficulty of the transfer, uh, transfer on them. So that kind of basically summarizes the, um, summarizes the guidelines. What we've been doing since that point in time is uh, seeking endorsements, disseminating them, speaking at uh, you know, different conferences. This is one where I spoke at the um, um, AF. P conference. Um, I, I was actually happy I, I got invited. I'm going to be speaking at the ACOG conference that's going to be coming up at the annual clinical meeting. And I was happy. Um, I've, I've spoken at other ACOG conferences. I can still remember about 10 years ago, I was speaking on perineal repair and I got my bag and it said, like in there, there were two bumper stickers that said, uh, home delivery is for pizzas. <laughs> that was in there. So I think we've come a long way and I'm, I'm looking forward to that meeting. <laughs> So I'm going to transition a little bit there from the transfer guidelines here to um, talk a little bit about University of New Mexico, uh, what we're doing, and then I'm going to uh, talk some about Dara Luce. Um, so UNM is, um, U New Mexico is a good state, I think you guys all know this probably, for midwives we have the highest proportion of midwifery hospital birth. Licensed midwifery in New Mexico has been legal for 30 years. We've always accepted transfers. Um, uh, but there's been varying levels of support. We had a birth center in the 1980s and then none until 2011. Um, and we have different mechanisms for transport. Um, we've had, you know, we're not, it hasn't been perfect that we've had historical issues. Um, you know, one of the women were, you know, casually described as the failed home birth. Did any of you guys have units that are still doing that? Calling a, failed home birth, um, lack of established relationships, uh, really just a lack of knowledge of the hospital-based providers and, uh, you know, and, uh, and nurses there, a wide variety of providers, differing attitudes, lack of um, records, desire for immediate discharge from L&D and how to accommodate uh, that. Um, some of the things that we did at, at UNM, we did presentations at OBGYN and Family Medicine Grand Rounds at home and hospital birth. Um, we discussed the newborn issues, and um, I don't really have time to go a lot into newborn issues, but I'd be happy to talk to you about other times. I think that's kind of the frontier that we still need to work on some, is trying to reach out more to the pediatric providers. We addressed the terminology there. We basically banned the term failed uh, birth center birth and failed home birth. You know, the comment that I made at Grand Rounds, I said, you know, we're a tertiary care center. We accept, you know, women from community hospitals. You'd never say a failed community hospital birth, so it's not a failed, it's not a failed birth, actually. This is like how it's supposed to work. And so we got rid of that uh, thing and got rid of the term lay midwives. Um, I was invited to the New Mexico Midwifery Free Association meeting to discuss issues of higher risk um, home births. And we tried to delineate, you know, who can have early discharge and not. 
I'm going to kind of skip through these sort of slides here so we're a little tight on time. But um, again, one of the issues that occurs and I think still occurs is, is this issue of early discharge. A lot of situations people have relationship with the maternity care providers, not with the pediatric providers. Um, our situation, I think we're, we're um, fortunate in Albuquerque, we're um, kind of have family medicine docs with advanced training. We do the babies as well, so that helps. Um, so what do you do about the baby if the mom wants early discharge? And you know, we've done different things. You know, one point in time, honestly, we were, what we were doing is we were not admitting the babies when the moms came in. Um, and that was sort of a solution that the nurses came up with, but then we sort of talked in the, the, the uh, university legal didn't think that was really a workable thing, that the baby's born there and not admitted. So we worked on differentiating low and high risk infants and such. So um, I, I added this because somebody suggested uh, how, to, how to work with uncooperative hospital or physicians. Patient safety perspective, it, it's such a buzzword now. There's a lot of initiatives, quality. Most hospitals have a safety thing. And just focusing on the word, we're, we're focusing on safety. We're not focusing on whether women are going to birth here or there. That's a reality. We're working on how to make it safe. Um, Try to figure out uh, bringing in, figure out who your you know allies, L and D, mother, baby unit manager. A lot of hospitals have a patient safety or quality director. Use these home birth transfer guidelines. They apply to a home or, or birth center. And um, actually, then the ACOG home birth statement is really, um, if you read this you know, carefully, uh, it's well worded, but it really says, and this, uh, this is for home birth, but it applies to birth center too, that we need to have them um, practicing within an integrated system, ready access to consultation. So this is very clear in the guidelines. We all should be uh, doing that. So let me transfer now. I'm going to talk about Dara Luce. And um, uh, it actually feels honestly sort of funny to talk about Dara Luce because um, you have the director here of Dara Luce, which is Abigail Eves. And maybe I want Abigail just to stand up and Melanie and, and uh, just to say hi. So um, Dara Luce, nationally accredited birth center, freestanding or mover operated. Um, it opened about four years ago. Started with two CNMs, or up to four. I've had almost 400 births. Um, established relationships with the hospitals. Um, Abigail and I actually met a long time ago. I think it was September 2001. She was telling me there. You know, um, about 10 years prior to the opening of the birth center, and, and talked about her. Uh, her vision, and I remember so crystal clear that day of kind of talking with her. Some people have been talking about a birth center for 20 years, and um, uh, she was, I think, still a student there, and she really had the vision of starting a, a birth center. And I kind of looked at her going, oh, I think you're going to be the one that does it, and it's been a total pleasure in Albuquerque to have the birth center there. So. Um, since so, I agreed to be the medical director consultant with transfers and agreement for emergency transfer to another hospital that's a little bit closer. Um, our system here that there's midwives always have ready telephone access to uh, one of four physicians for any questions regarding maternal, newborn, or primary care, refer outpatient consultations, versions, and a part of collaborative care transfer for things like GDM or preeclampsia. And just to sort of show the statistics here, and I mean, I think these are statistics like most of your birth centers, which are, you know, all quite good with relatively low number of, uh, uh, no, low number of transfers. Interpartum consultations, um, basically there's two of us in that are basically do most of us, uh, I think about 90% of the time, either myself or my partner Nicole can be reached. Um, we are, our labor and delivery is committed to always accepting transfer after physician contact. Um, we usually discuss the, the plan of care while the client is still at the birth center, and so prepare for that. And then um, um, my role is often to go in there. I really try to, to um, to go there and meet the midwives and the women. I found that kind of moment of transfer is really kind of a delicate time. I mean, I think that sort of what you see some of the guys, like a lot of women, they've been ha having a very intimate experience with their midwives for um, for eight months. And then, you know, unfortunately, sometimes the image of the hospital is, is, you know, is the business of being born. And so there's kind of this image of it's gonna be like a, a factory. So we really try to sit there, I think, um, I find that first 30 minutes or so seems to be really important on that transfer. So transfer back to Dara Luce. Um, the midwives accompany the woman transfer, stay connected throughout the labor process, visit postpartum, and we resume postpartum care with, uh, as soon as possible. Um, issues with transport, though, things that um, uh, learned here. Initially, some clients felt unprepared. They might have chosen a doula if they had planned a hospital birth and the newborn care issues. So 
here's a little uh, image here that I think is uh, uh, what some patients uh, think is going to be waiting them when they get to the hospital, the full body MRI for the entire labor, your conference call doctor does a robotic C-section. I think this is sort of the image there. So, so we've, um, uh, what, uh, what Dar Darlis has done is really do much more psychological preparation for transfer or start at the orientation with clients. Hospital is not a bad and evil place. It's actually maybe where you need to be in certain situations. Um, um, and this is all sort of taken actually from the website. Communication during all phases of the pregnancy and then partnered with the New Life Doula Collective. So there's doulas that are actually transfer doulas that um, really are available 24 hours a day if a woman needs to transfer. Um, transfer classes. So. Um, uh, the quote here, no one wants to think about it or plan for it, but a minor portion of our moms do transfer. And so these classes are, you know, are required, or at least required to be offered to every Dara Luce mom. So I think these have really helped. I mean, I kind of watched when these started. Um, what happens at a transfer class? You meet the doulas, meet facilitators, meet a family that actually transferred to the hospital to find out what it was like for them, and then learn the midwives talk about preparation. I'm going to skip through this one. You can kind of look at this, but this is from the Transfer Doulas. There's a collective that actually does this. So how do, how do the statistics um, work? Um, I, I think it's working well as far as, you know, um, uh, the proportion of uh, total vaginal births. And this is actually from all women who are continuing care. So really high rates of um, normal vaginal delivery, low rates of cesarean. Even if you look in the women that are admitted in labor, um, I don't think we're going to be able to meet the 2014 uh, goal, but we had a 99% vaginal delivery rate um, of the women who transferred to the hospital. Of the uh, 15, 16, only one wound up with the, with the C-section. So we were really happy for that year. Um, so just an overview of the, how the collaboration works there. So there's continuity between antenatal, intrapartum, postpartum, and newborn consultation. Um, try to have a relatively small number of uh, uh, folks here. We have family medicine obstetric fellowship trained physicians. So they're, they do mom and baby care, but they've also been trained in higher risk operative obstetrics. Um, but all have kind of strong support for physiological birth. Um, are actually used to doing their own intrapartum continuity-based care. We integrate the newborn care. The intrapartum care is continuity-based, you know, meaning that one of the two or three of us you know, will come there and then be involved you know, throughout the labor and usually at the birth as well. Um, we're lucky enough to have a baby-friendly hospital with a low intervention rate, and we have involvement in supportive maternity care leadership. So that's kind of like a little bit of a quick, quick uh, overview there. Um, I want to mention kind of one other thing here a little bit, which is, you know, we talked about where there's only kind of one C-section there, and we've had more of that in the past here. And I'm just going to diverge a little bit, which is to talk about briefly something else we're working on, which is um, how can a needed cesarean still be a positive, you know, birth experience here? And some of you are probably familiar with this. It's the whole idea of what's called the general C-section, minimizing people in the OR, having the doula and the midwife in the OR in addition to a maternal partner. The women in this process can observe the baby being delivered through the abdomen, doing delayed cord clamping with the infant inches away, skin to skin in the OR and supporting latch on in the OR. Um, we've been doing this in, the, in our hospital for the last couple of years, finally have like actually a protocol. And you know, we're, um, we're certainly not trying to normalize C-section. Most of the women that are doing these are women who've had, you know, three prior C-sections, prior myomectomies kind of indicated. Um, but it's been really powerful. I've learned a lot from the women, from this woman who had all their babies by C-sections, and then they're able to watch the baby come out of their abdomen, have the baby go skin to skin. So I just kind of, I'm kind of almost pitching this here a little bit for you guys to kind of see this. And I think that um, I, my, my own belief is that birth center birth is optimal birth for most women. And you, and you guys are the advocates for that. And so I'd encourage you to try to, when you're meeting with, try to advocate for this because for your clients that do need to get a C-section, that way they still have what feels like a birth experience. So here's a quick little photo that I'm sharing with that. This is one of my, um, my patients here. She had had a prior myomectomy and she needed to have a C-section. You can see we've dropped the drape here. She's seeing over the drape. So you can see uh, that's, I'm, I'm there with the baby there. You can see the baby coming out of her belly. Now we're holding up the baby there and she's seeing the baby coming out of her belly. And here you can see that smile goes on her face there. She's seeing the baby and the baby basically uh, went you know, right to her. And so 
Um, and we're trying to all avoid C-sections, but when they have to happen, I think that's one thing as far as our transfers to try to make them births also. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna transition here onto um, Heike Hornsby is gonna talk about the, her birth center. So some of these you have already seen because it is part, I also um, looked at part of the home birth summit and the transfer guidelines. So I did take some of those same slides actually. And um, this is part from the home birth summit as well. And you guys have already read that. It is, I also want to encourage everybody, we don't call our physicians in our hospital a backup hospital or a backup um, physician, we call them collaborating physician, and our receiving hospital now collaborating hospital. Because backup has a little bit of that connotation of that we need somebody to catch us when we fall, and we're not falling. We are just going to the next level of care that is needed. So I really encourage you to lose that word backup, especially when you're working with new hospitals and you are training them to work with you. So uh, I firmly believe that it is a shared responsibility when there is a transfer of all units that are part of this transfer. For one, the client need to be, they need to be flexible. They need to understand that they're not going to get everything that they would have expected in the hospital. If they need PIT, they're going to have continuous fetal monitoring, and we try to prepare them in prenatal care before that happens. At the same time, the midwife needs, the midwife's job is to advocate and to continue to facilitate and um, not go into this hostile environment. And even if there is a doc that you know you're not gonna get along with, you have to do your best because in order for the client to have trust, we need to facilitate that by smoothing over the situation if that is needed. And then for the hospital, my request to the hospital and to the nurses and the physician is for them to understand that these clients come in and they need to continue the shared decision-making process, meaning you need to present the problem if there's time, obviously, and have the clients still being able to decide on various things that are an option. We have plenty of studies out there that show clearly that women's satisfaction and what they remember and feel about their birth, even 20, 30 years after their birth, is not, did that baby come out the right hole? Or did that baby have a cesarean? What matters is, do they feel like they were part of the decision-making process throughout their birth? And that is still a part of empowerment that can still happen in the hospital. So I encourage you when you talk to your local hospitals, ask them and have them maybe understand that that is an important part for women to still feel at peace with their birth. So I want to talk a little bit about the Smooth Transition Program and then I want to give you examples of two local hospitals that I work with. Smooth Transition is a program that was developed by the Perinatal Advisory Committee, which is a Department of Health um, suggested group that includes midwives, family physicians, um, neonatal, pediatric, what else is on there, um, and obviously uh, midwives licensed midwives and nurse midwives, and they meet and they tackle these big problems. And one of them that they came up with was to create a program that is replicable, that um, can be presented to hospitals, and that way there is a standard and there is a guideline that hospitals can follow. It now lives within MOS, which is the Midwifery Association of Washington State. And uh, we have Audrey Levine, who you can reach if you have questions from her. I have a phone number and her contact information in the slides that you have in your packet. And um, they go around and they present the Smooth Transition Program to various hospitals. They go at least to one hospital a month, and it is a physician 
and a midwife that go together presenting the hospital administrators. And what they try to do is to get all the parties that are involved in a transfer into the same room. So we have you know, the ICU administration, the um, risk management people, the labor and delivery unit uh, nurses, the managers of the labor and delivery unit. So everybody gets into a room and listens to that presentation. And it is pretty much based on what Larry was talking about on the Home Birth Summit as well. So there's the project manual. It is available to anybody who wants to use it. You click on that, you get all the information. We encourage you to use it. Audrey right now is working on a grant to make this a nationwide program. So the brief overview, pretty much similar to what he was talking about, you know, create that committee within the hospital of all the major players. Then um, we we'll invite all the licensed midwives, or there are very few nurse midwives in Washington State doing out of hospital birth. So the few that there are, there's only one that actually can then go deliver babies in the hospital. Everybody else has to transfer care to the collaborating hospital. So then we bring the midwives from the community in on that meeting. There is a survey tool, which examples are also in that packet, that after a transfer, the main people fill out. So the nurses give a report, the receiving physician gives a report, and the transferring midwives gives a report. Then there's a quarterly meeting of the um, committee to review these evaluations and to see where there needs to be improvement, who's still grumpy, what doesn't work for them, how can we improve it. And then a yearly summary is submitted to the perineal advisory committee. And then the, the hope is that eventually everybody works out their differences and they create their own protocols and their own, you know, whatever works for that particular community. And once everybody feels like that that's working smoothly, that then they discontinue the actual program and it just becomes part of everyday life. So please use it. Um, one other thing that I want to point out, we have created something in Washington State that um, was created by the Foundation for Healthcare Quality, and it's called OB-COPE. What OB-COPE is, is that every stakeholder in maternity care, all the hospitals and all the midwives for home birth and all the midwives that do hospital birth have to keep statistics and submit them. So we have mandatory stats keeping for all these units that then go to the Foundation for Healthcare Equality and get assessed. So we are comparing low-risk mother data in hospitals to low-risk mother data in the out-of-hospital setting, and it is mandatory. You cannot carry a license anymore in Washington State unless you participate in data collection because it is so vital for our survival. What this has, aside from that it's a pain, but you know, we have to do it. What it has given us as midwives and the hospital is a state-sanctioned peer review process. What that means is, is that we now can meet in the hospital after a transfer that didn't go so well or one that had a bad outcome, we can meet and review the case and it's not discoverable. Because before the problem was, if you have a bad outcome and there's a chance of litigation, nobody wanted to talk about it because then it's discoverable by the lawyers. And that felt like a huge problem in terms of creating improvement, in terms of creating collaboration, and in terms of everybody just kind of getting their emotions on the table because it's really hard on the physicians as well if there's a baby that you know they can't get out or that, that might die on them or that might have problems. So it was a way to talk about it, like, well, why didn't you come in earlier? Well, why did you guys delay the section when we called you and we knew that baby needed to come out right now? So it is possible to have these processes now without the threat of that then going to a litigation lawyer. So I encourage you all, yeah, I encourage you all to create a state sanctioned peer review program. It, it's possible in every single state, 
And it gives you a lot of freedom. It also gives you a lot of freedom when you want to meet with your other peers and discuss a case. If you do it under the auspices of, this, of the protected peer review, if you don't have hospital privileges, you might not have that available to you. And um, it's a great learning tool and healing. Okay, the other thing that was created in this process was, this is only half the sheet because I couldn't fit it all on there for you to actually see. In your packet are the full forms. There's a maternal referral form from out of hospital birth to the hospital. And then there is a newborn referral form out of hospital. Obviously, if you are in an emergency and it's super time sensitive, you fill this out afterwards. But if you have a non-emergency transfer, this has on one page everything the receiving hospital personnel needs to know. So they don't have to comb through packets and packets of, of um, charts. They still read the chart afterwards when they have time, but if it, this is like the overview. This is like the nuts and bolts of this is who this woman is, this is the problem, this is her history, you know, GBS, any issues, boom, here it is. So that is also in your packet. Please use it. You can also modify it um, according to what we have not done is to completely comply with accreditation, you know, all the data that you need to collect for hospital transfer. I think there's one or two pieces missing and I just did not have those slides with me. But so look that over. So in terms of the hospitals that we have in our birth center, our birth center has been in Kirkland for 20 years. The first 17 years, it was extraordinarily difficult. They um, would take our emergency transfers, but anything that was not emergency, we would call over there, and there were either no nurses available, or they had no beds, or they would tell, tell us, frankly, not to come. And um, yeah, they were like, just go somewhere else. We, we don't want you here. And I, I'm a pretty tough cookie, but I have been in tears after you know, a 20 hour labor and you need to transfer and you know you're gonna get shit on and yelled at. That is not acceptable and I have to say it is the single hardest part of my job is to be disrespected. So we have this fabulous woman named Valerie Sasson and one day she just had enough and for whatever reason all the stars aligned and she wrote this kick-ass letter um, saying, okay, what gives? We have a, you know, master's degree, degree program five miles from your hospital. We have a uh, accredited and licensed birth center here. We've been here. We have awesome stats, blah, blah, blah. Like, get, get on it, people. And um, also what we did was we said, you are a community hospital that is funded and supported by your taxpayers. Your taxpayers just voted in another bond issue for you to extend this hospital and build more shiny units. And we basically demanded from the commissioners that they meet with us because the women that we were serving were women out of their community that paid taxes to that hospital. Their property taxes were funding that bond and that it was absolutely unacceptable for them to disregard these women's needs. And that got their attention. So, and you know, just that, I, I really think it was the brilliance of Valerie to just kind of say, boom, you, you've got to or we're gonna go to the press. And we've tried that before and it didn't work. So who knows why it worked this time. Um, so now we have uh, quarterly meetings with them and open lines of communication between the hospital. So if something wasn't quite right, um, I can email them and say, hey, you know, my client got a lecture for having a home birth, what gives? And they're like, well, ACOG still says home birth is not okay, so we can do that. Um, but at least, at least we're talking, and it has gotten better. We got the, um, the director of the maternity unit, who is this fabulous nurse with a vision, on board and um, she basically made a rule that there will never be a no. If you call, you come. We will accept you. So that was a huge change and the um, director of the hospital 
um, the hospital physicians that are all now, you know, 24 7, we have hospitalists now, and that was the other major change before was private practice groups that covered call. Now we have the hospitalists, and the hospitalists needed money. That was another reason. So they're like the babies, and they're like the mommies coming in. And they're also, they were there 24 7 anyway, so nobody had to come in. Well, the head of the hospitalist basically said to his colleagues, you will work with these midwives or we will initiate dr draconian measures. So, <laughs> so we have, you know, we have them. Should I leave? Okay. Um, anyway, so we have, the difficulty is, is that we have a few hospitalists that like us and a few hospitalists that are forced to do it. So they still need work, and our hospital refuses to be part of the smooth transition program. So this is our protocol that the hospital has given us. It's also in your packet. It's you know several pages long. Look at it. The big difference in this hospital is is that they will not uh, consult with us. Period. They will only like if you send a patient there, it's theirs. They will not talk to us to anybody over the phone. Even if we transfer in, they will not speak to us. If it's not in the chart, they will assess it themselves. Completely and totally mind-boggling to me, but even the progressive doctor is like, no, I want to make my own assessment. If it's not in the chart, it was obviously not important. Um, then we have the, the second hospital that we have is a local university teaching hospital, the University of Washington. They decided that they were obligated to serve childbearing women because it was already legalized in the state, so the voters had decided. So for them, it, it was not a question of yes and no, it was just a question of how do we do it. And uh, we have those OBs always available to us for antepartum and intrapartum consultations. They uh, respect us as colleagues, so when I call in and I'm there, it is an equal relationship. It is fabulous, I'm loving it, our clients love it. It is a great place to transfer to now. The uh, only thing that is not so great about it is that there's a lot of residents. So, and they also refer back to the midwife if medically indicated. So can someone, I can send someone in there for a PIH evaluation and you know, if, they're, if they don't have PIH, they send them back to us and we automatically get records which we cannot get from our other hospital. They will not send us records, I don't know why. And um, yeah, so this is our experience with our two different hospitals. Use the smooth transition program, use these transfer data sheets Thank you. Well, obviously we don't have enough time to really um, focus on um, so much that we have to talk about today. And I'm gonna channel my inner first grade teacher. I did not bring you slides, so it's all eyes on me, okay? Um, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about Arbor Center, but actually, um, let me put this up here. It looks like there's some. Um, our birth center started in 1995. It is a certified nurse midwife center. Our practice is with family medicine. We fought hard for us to have privileges in the hospital. So a lot of this doesn't pertain to us because we can actually go in the ambulance and go with our moms and be in the hospital with them. So what I've done for you, and um, everybody who knows me knows that um, I don't do much of the computer, but if you look on your QR thing, I was gonna call it your QVC symbol, um, because actually what I've done for you, I have put together a packet because I'm a very anal nurse midwife and I want cookbooks. So in your handouts, you are going to have an eight page Women's Birth and Wellness Center arrangement with family medicine, how it works with our decision making of who goes to who, you are actually going to have the Women's Birth and Wellness Center, North Carolina College of Emergency Physicians Standard Policy, because we've had issues with folks who have transferred with the EMTs. One point, um, I was physically grabbed and was told to get out of the ambulance. 
where the nurse midwife on the other end was pushing me in saying, but she has the Doppler, she has the Doppler, because there are no Dopplers on, a, on an emergency transfer whatsoever. I've included our neonatal resuscitation documentation form so that when the nurses are all hustling around and they're going to make that transfer to the hospital, you have that. I've got the consent for transfer and the birth center transfer form. So it's all there in your packet so that you don't have to worry about, um, you can use it. Um, our backup physician said, yes, please go ahead and share it with folks. So we actually have an arrangement with Family Medicine that we actually pay them to be our backup. Because when we set up the birth center, we were not able to get OB to be our backup. They didn't want to be our backup. They said we would take from their residency program and no way in hell were they going to take us. And the family medicine took us, they better pay us, pay you. So we do pay. We have a physician, Martha Carlo, who is trained in global family medicine. So it's very different working with someone who has global perspective, especially when she talks about women walking around in Kathmandu and Foley catheters fall out on the uh, main street, that why can't we do fully bulb catheters to induce somebody at the birth center and see before they have to go into the hospital or so. So having that kind of backup, we have been very, very lucky, but we just didn't find it. It was based on the fact that we'd had a birth center in the community for 11 years, and when that birth center closed, we had to look at a new way of getting into the system and moving it into a major community, Chapel Hill. Um, and that took about two years of sitting down and really talking with folks. But when we set it up, we made it very clear. We wanted privileges at the hospital. We wanted to be able to deliver our own folks. We go into the hospital with our folks. We go in the ambulance if we're transferring the mother. We are actually the accepting provider, which was very hard for the EMTs to understand. When we got to the hospital, that they were gonna be giving report to me and that I would be making the, the report to OB or family medicine if I needed it, but the number one reason we transfer, as we all know, is Pitocin and an epidural most of the time. And if we have to do a transfer, which is a really emergency one, we are calling the hospital. We have a whole list right by the phone that this is what the folks are gonna say to those transferring folks. We're coming to the hospital, the nurse midwives in the ambulance. This is what's happening. We're thinking we're needing an emergency C-section. We go in the door. They're ready for us. There's no questions asked. We go back into the operating room if need be, or we go admit our mother to the labor and delivery and then consult with our physicians. We always consult family medicine first and let them know that we're on our way into the hospital. But if we know we're gonna need OB, we'll say this is what's happening, but we've already made the call to OB because we're feeling we're gonna need some real quick assistance here. For the first couple of years when I opened the birth center, the nursing staff were the hardest folks to understand what we were doing. And I had a nurse one day who, when I was going in, uh, the first year we were open, we would always go as a doula with our patients. And there was a doula that she had and her mother. And the nurse came in and said, you can't be in this room, there's too many people. And family medicine was taken care of, and of course there was a resident, so there were a lot of people, and I didn't want to make a scene. But she never told me that again because I pulled a rocking chair up to the outside door and I rocked for eight hours until that mother had that baby. So every time she had to go in, she saw me sitting there and smiling and it never happened again. <laughs> and at this hospital now, we've worked very hard when we go in, even if we're going with family medicine, we're letting OB know this is what's happening. We've called family medicine, we may need you, but hopefully we're not going to. I teach how to start a birth center. I teach that we have to be open, we have to be honest, and we have to go in and have that, that the birth center is part of the larger healthcare system, that we have to make it work. And unfortunately, well not for, for, fortunately, rather for us, because I'm a CNM, it's made it a little bit easier and we don't have CPMs in North Carolina and it's very difficult for them to go into the hospital but we do have CNMs that are doing home birth and they also are trying to use the same type of protocol with family medicine so that we're not labeled as train wrecks. And by being on the hospital for a number of years now, a lot of the folks at the hospital have had babies with us. So when we come in, the nurses kind of self-select who's gonna be with this patient. And they'll say, we're so sorry that you have to come to the hospital here, but you've got great staff, we're here to help you and we're gonna do the best we can because it's not so much where you have the baby, but that your, the ultimate outcome is a healthy mother and a healthy baby. 
So in order to give time for you all to answer questions, you really do have 14 pages from my birth center, and it'll really tell you exactly, like um, when you flip to the second page, for your information. These are phone calls that we're making that we know we're gonna take that patient and we're coming in and this is what we're gonna do. Family medicine may not even be on the floor. They are not required to be on the floor because the OBs are. We will also let them know, but the majority of the time we are going in, delivering our patients, admitting them to downstairs. We do all the mother care, family medicine does the baby care, and they can get out within about four to six hours. And we have had patients who have come in just basically for maybe an epidural um, or maybe just a little pit, no epidural, and want to go home from L&D, and they have facilitated that where family medicine will come up and do the baby care because they know we're going to be making that home visit and the follow-up phone calls. It took a couple of years, but we're really valued as part of that healthcare system. And because, I think, of the relationship they had with us, um, about five years into our being at the birth center, actually eight years, we were fired by the folks who had hired us, a federally qualified healthcare center, basically because once UNC saw how well nurse midwifery worked and that we weren't taking from the residents, we were bringing folks to the hospital that may have never come to that hospital. They wanted to start their own midwifery practice. Little did they know, we bought the birth center, made it a not-for-profit, never missed a beat. One day we were at Piedmont Women's Health Center, met midnight, the Cinderella clock, we were Women's Birth and Wellness Center, we're doing 500 deliveries a year, and the nurse midwives in our community are also doing 500 deliveries a year. So it may take, as I talk about birth center workshop, the number one word is network, network, network. Be honest, get that communication out there, and fight for the women that you feel like you want to have at your birth center and that you're going to be their biggest advocate. So I will leave it. Four questions. Or any of us. Yes, would you go to the mic? If you turn the little button on top, it should go. It's on. Um, I don't really have as much of a question as just a comment that has to do with the family practice residents. Um, we also have a big residency program in Boise, Idaho, and we have a I just the perfect transfer situation. I mean, we have the group of laborists, we have direct communication with them, it's really wonderful. But in terms of the family practice um, residents, we have them come to the birth center and like tour the birth center. We have family practice residents who are doing, um, you know, spending time at the birth center. They're going to some um, either birth center or home births. Um, they come because they want to get a different perspective on you know, hour-long prenatal visits right. on how that can work. So we have found that just welcoming the family practice residents has really been beneficial, both for our moms who feel very happy about, wow, they're, they, they're involved in changing the healthcare system down the road, perhaps, and um, has been a really great situation. And then they're, they're at, the, at their births if they do transport to mm -hmm. the hospital. So. We have the exact okay. same thing with our physician. We do a two-hour um, consultative service every week on Tuesday so that we actually present all our patients who are being admitted to the birth center, um, who have had deliveries either in the hospital or at the birth center. We go over all our new OBs. We go over all our problem visits because we'll have babies with anomalies that we're going to be delivering in the birth center. We take care of our own gestational diabetics unless they need insulin or gliburide or so. So we'll go over all of that, and because we also have two family nurse practitioners on staff, we do GYN care, so the family medicine residents and sometimes medical students will come in, and actually our own um, nurse midwifery students are always invited to be at those two-hour meetings because they can learn so much, and then they get a tour of the birth center, and if they'd like to do a two-week rotation with us, 
They can't deliver in the birth center. They have to sit on their hands and watch a true midwifery physiological birth happen because they don't get to see that really in the hospital because that clock is ticking when they come in the door. But that is so very important for them to see that it can be different. On our side of the Mississippi, I can tell you from teaching how to start a birth center workshop, family medicine is not as well accepted um, as it is on the other side of the Mississippi. So our folks have to fight for their patients in the hospital. They don't do C-sections. And the majority of the time, once they get out, they might start doing OB, but a lot of times they may or may not last, or they go to a practice on the other side of the Mississippi. But please, if you're starting a birth center, don't risk out um, family medicine, because for us, it was one-stop shopping, mother, primary care, and the baby, and it is absolutely dynamite. Otherwise, it would be OB, internal medicine, and peds, and that's too much of a headache. We also have uh, the family medicine model, and it's great. Um, just two comments. One, uh, when we opened our birth center, we had EMS. Every EMS worker came through our birth center, so we did a lot of work with them up front. We also contacted EMS has to answer to like their regional medical yes. director. So contacting and reaching out to them. So we really worked out protocols, whose roles are who. So if we transport, we never have a problem that the midwife is going, and it's really, uh, the EMS has been great. Uh, and the second thing, I'm glad to hear that you're working on kind of a national designation. It makes me think of, you know, baby-friendly hospital initiative, uh -huh. that hospitals could be designated, whatever you call it, something really positive, so that transports would be smooth, too. That's great. Yeah, you have to understand with EMTs that once you call them and they come into your facility, they're in charge. So for some of the folks, that was a big difficulty that it was like, oh, what do you mean you're coming in the ambulance? So we have that in writing, that we are allowed to get in the ambulance because we've got the fetoscope. They're not standard on EMT ambulances at all. I just have a brief comment. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me how to get the slides in the handout. So yes. you take your book, you open it up, Right here, inside the front cover, is the link. Right, so your QVC just, code for shopping. So I, I just want to make that clear. They'll get there. If they're not there now, they'll get there. Yeah, they should be, because I sent mine in a month ago, because I knew Kelly would be berating me if I didn't. OK. I have a, actually a question that I think for, for, for all of us. You know, I see, first of all, thank you so much. This is really fabulous. I see these silos of home birth and birth center birth. And so there's a birth center summit, or no, a home birth summit. And then we, you know, and I wonder if we could come up with a word for other than out of hospital birth. I don't like out of hospital birth because it's like non physician provider. I mean, it's like, okay, I'm not a non person. Or, so, yeah, I mean, can, yeah. can, can we? as the home birth people and, and the birth center people come up with a term that everybody agrees and start using that because the principles are so similar. Right. And I when don't I do tours for the birth center, I said essentially this is a home birth. You have to accept this is like a home birth. Instead of me coming to your home, you're coming to my home because we live here just about. <laughs> right. Yeah. So that's a concept. But, right. But we need a, a term. I mean, community, do you have one? Community-based is what I use always now for all of the community-based you know. birth. Community-based birth. Yes. yes. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Community-based. OK. Thank you, Cynthia. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I, I did check with Kelly before I came in here, because I'm a very anal midwife for any of you that know me. And I said, are you sure? all of this is going to be on the website and she assured me so if it's not she uploaded it but i think you can also go on the um aabc workshop and they should be there because i sent 16 pages because i like cookbooks and i do have permission what you're going to have here is also um what i included in here which might be helpful for some of you is guidelines for working relationship between the Department of OBGYN, the Department of Family Medicine at the University of North Carolina, and between physicians and nurses in the UNC Women's Health Hospital Labor and Delivery Unit. This came about when midwives started doing births in the hospital and out of hospital. So it really covers all the intricacies of communication between the four groups. Okay? And I will make sure this will be available. Any other questions? Well then, as the first grade teacher, class dismissed. Yeah.